In this video, we will hear a truly fascinating story about how Dr. Jan Paul Molière from Belgium invented opiate free anesthesia. In the story, he tells an incredible tale of how he was stuck with a patient who was allergic to opioids and requested only hypnosis instead of anesthesia. To his surprise, it worked, and they were able to operate on a patient's knee without any anesthesia drugs. Dr. Moliere was shocked by the success, but being a scientist, he knew that this would not be possible in all patients. He then went on to develop a method that is similar to hypnosis that controls the sympathetic nervous system, but without opioids. So stay tuned to this fascinating story from the birth of fentanyl to the birth of opioid-free anesthesia. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about opioid-free anesthesia. What got you into this field? Oh, that's a long story. But uh, it started actually with, with the, the first aspect, the patient coming to me and said, I'm allergic to any opioids at all and to any drug. Please, can you give me hypnosis? And this was a very aggressive uh, procedure. I couldn't believe that. I was never the expert in that. Uh, but finally, I agreed and I said on three conditions. First, I want to measure everything that happens. I want to have an infusion line. And if in any case something happened, there will be no discussion. I will give whatever drug is needed to keep you safe. But I promise to do an effort and not to give any drug, even no local regional infiltration, zero, zero. And we'll see an open knee procedure. An elderly patient, the patient per se was an old nurse anesthetist but you can say nurse anesthesia doesn't exist here in Belgium, but the nurse assisting in anesthesia. So she was quite aware. I couldn't really give anything. She would be aware of that. We went off and we brought her in an hypnotic state. And to my surprise, this worked perfect. No drug was right. But what I learned was you can bring a patient in a full stress-free situation without any sympathetic stimulation. The patient went in a bradycardia. The patient went a little bit hypotensive, no sweating. This was the perfect anesthesia. She was only full away and didn't get any, any drug. Now, you cannot do that with every patient, but suddenly realize you can block the sympathetic system. That's what we need. That's what the opioids also are doing. But are there no other drugs to block the, the sympathetic system? And if we can find them, we don't need the opioids. Because we started the European Society for Periodic Care of the Obese Patients. We were always telling obese patients, free, we have OSAS, and the big problems are the opioids. So if we can reduce the opioids, this would be great. But this is impossible. You cannot give an anesthesia, general anesthesia, without any opioids. You might do that if you can do local regional. That's one approach. So some are doing the epidurals, but if you inflate the abdomen under an epidural, it's not ideal either. You cannot breathe, certainly in obese patients. So I started working and said, what can we do to avoid the opioids? As patients can do that under hypnosis. And then also at the same time, I met guys who did research with Janssen's Pharmaceutica and I was a little bit angry saying, you left us. Janssen's made every opioid, fentanyl, sufentanyl, alfentanyl, carfentanyl, you name it, every opioid, synthetic opioid is made by Paul Janssen's. And I thought, except Remy fentanyl. And I said, this is extremely strong and short acting opioid. Why didn't you? And they said, you're wrong. We at Janssen's Pharmaceutic, we invented Remy fentanyl. But Paul came along at one day and he said, what did you make such a strong opioid? This is a disaster. This is like an atom bomb you should never have made. As long as I live, I don't want to get Remy fentanyl on the market under my name. Why was he so upset? Well, he remembers the face 64 when he wanted to introduce fentanyl. Uh, invented also in America. The FDA refused and say we anesthesiologists, we don't need opioids to do anesthesia. We need an opioid after the surgery to cover the pain, but not to have hemodynamic stability. It took him years and years of discussion, whatever, and finally said, let's add drop peridol with fentanyl. Then you only can give a very small dose. To, yeah. And that's how the FDA approved the fentanyl first in America. The Castro here in Belgium, 
who said, well, but what if we now inject 10 ampoules of fentanyl and drop a result? And so patients were sleeping for three days. At that time, patients were staying two weeks in the hospital. That didn't and, matter. That didn't matter. So that was even great for yeah. neurosurgery. At this point, the use of high-dose opioids to block the sympathetic nervous system became the norm in anesthesia practice, as opioids were simply the most convenient method of accomplishing anesthesia. And here's how that happened. But then realizing this was not the best approach, FDA approved fentanyl as an independent drug without uh, the addition of norperidol. And finally, even in America, we start using more and more opioids because anesthesia was never stress-free. That was a big problem. And so we assumed if we give very, very high doses of an opioid, maybe we are stress-free. And this went on, and even I learned if initially in my early years to use hardly one or two cc's of fentanyl, and at the end of my training, we were injecting 100 cc's of fentanyl to do a case. This was high, higher doses. But Kellett came out and said, you guys, it's still stress because inflammation is still going on. The sympathetic system is not sufficient block even whatever dose of opioids you are given. So we have to reduce, but it's difficult. It's difficult and we cannot do that. So we all said impossible, impossible. But is it possible to reduce the stress response to surgery in the sympathetic nervous system without opioids? Let's hear Dr. Bollier's fascinating story on how clonidine, magnesium, IV lidocaine and ketamine made their way into anesthesia practice as precursors of today's opiate-free anesthesia. But having the case of the hypnosis in mind, said there should be a way. Having my good friend uh, Mark at UCL, who was using a high, high dose of clonidin to have not the, the, the problems afterwards, I said, but the patient was sleeping again three days. I said, there must be a way around of shortening acting. So instead of using one drug, I said, if we combine different drugs that block the sympathetic system, we might have a patient that is waking faster. So let's combine clonidine with other drugs. You start investigating, and by surprise, you see that lidocaine intravenously has been given before the 60s to block the sympathetic system and to do anesthesia. These data are out. You run that you see magnesium even has been used in extremely high doses to give anesthesia. It didn't work always nice only with magnesium because the patient was not sleeping enough. The same with the lidocaine, because that time it was one drug doing all. And so they failed with magnesium, they failed with lidocaine, with procaine, but at least there was some effect of uh, blocking the sympathetic system. Uh, ketamine also, but yeah, if you give too much, you have hallucinations. Say, what, what if we make a combination of all these different drugs that block the sympathetic system? Maybe we realize a full block of the sympathetic system, like the patient with hypnosis doing that from the cerebral out. And in this regard, as we have different drugs in a low dose, the patient will be working faster. Uh, clonidine was not the ideal, but in Europe, dexmedicine was not available, so we had to wait still several years before we got that drug. Did you know that veterinary anesthesiologists used opioid-free anesthesia in animal surgery decades before opioid-free era of anesthesia in humans began? Here's how lions are put to sleep in the jungle without opioids. And I still remember that in the veterinary, they were using dexmedium in very, very high doses. And even when I was in training, I remember doing a, a darker sleep and I asked to one of the guys, I said, but you're not giving any opioids. And he said, Oh, I give meditomidin and it's a dog, don't worry, and the procedure. So the dog will never tell you the troubles. <laughs> Actually, if the dog ever had told me how fine the anesthesia was, <laughs> why <laughs> would you wait 30 years to find that out? So I went also to the veterinary anesthesiologist telling how do you do? Oh, well, we use dexmedetomin even in very high doses. That's perfect. They keep breathing without any problem. They, are, they, they do not react to any pain stimuli. This is wonderful. We even have atipamazole, an antidote. And when we go to doses, one even to 10 microgram per kilogram, and we don't need any other drug. But at the end, we have atipamazole, even a line, you know what they used to shoot a line in wild? Well, they use dexmedetomidine up to 10 microgram per kilogram. 
And then the line will still be briefing. You can operate on him without any anesthesia machine. You don't need anything else. And the end of the procedure, you inject intramuscular uh, the atipamazole. In 10 minutes, the line stood up, walks around. Otherwise, he will be eaten up by his colleagues. <laughs> that's the big problem. If you give an anesthetic that's working too long in the wild, you have to take the line with you and whatever. So this is the ideal approach. We cannot do that in humans, but we can learn and understand what's going on. So long story short, the combination of alpha-2 agonist clonidine or even better dexmodidine with a small dose of ketamine below hallucination level with lidocaine. We don't need the 5-6 milligrams per kilogram, just 1 milligram per kilogram. Some magnesium, wonderful. We block the sympathetic system without any opioid. We even don't need paracetamol and SIDs during the procedure. Now, if you can add local regional, it's great because when the patient wakes up, this mixture will help, but still the patient will feel some pain. That's the moment you will have to start with the classical non-opioid analgetics. Even you might need an opioid. Giving large dose of opioids is a huge mistake. Here's how administration of high dose of opioids during surgery is undesirable and can be dangerous because of the tolerance that develops very quickly. Many colleagues said, well, what does it make the difference? If you need an opioid after, why, why shouldn't we give it already earlier? Preemptive analgesia, uh, preventive analgesia, and all these aspects. Actually, if you look to the, the literature, tolerance. The, the tolerance and the hyperalgesia, you are full right. The tolerance is a big problem. Now, the tolerance, if you look up morphine, as a tolerance within six hours, a continuous infusion of morphine is having no analytic property anymore. So after six hours, continuous infusion of morphine, you need to double the dose to get again analgesia. Now this is morphine. Now if you take Sufenta, this is short. If you take Remifenta, it's only one hour and a half and the effect is already gone. You need to double and to double the dose to have again suppression uh, and have analgesia. So the tolerance for analgesia is so strong. Now the tolerance for, 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 for vomiting and whatever is extremely slowly. That takes days, even months. And so there's a difference in tolerance, even also the tolerance for breathing. And that's the big problem. If we would be tolerant for respiratory depression, well, why should I care to double the dose of an opioid? because the respiration would adapt, but that tolerance is takes days. And so we need to double to three double the duals to have still analgesia, but at the same time, you depress dramatically respiratory drive. And that's where, where the real fact comes that if you can reduce the opioids intraoperative and not use high, high doses to get the seemingly perfect stress-free anesthesia, you keep the opioids when the patient wakes up and there is no tolerance. The same with hyperalgesia. Hyperalgesia means that if I touch you like this, it's not painful now. But if you got opioids, suddenly this is also becoming pain. Your, 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 your uh, level is decreasing. Uh, and that's a problem because if your level decreases, you will ask earlier for an analgetic. And as nothing else is working, you'll ask earlier for an opioid. That is not working either, so you need the double dose with the respiratory depression. So to focus on the respiratory pressure for the obese patients, keep take the opioids out, use drugs that block the sympathetic system sufficiently by a combination of several drugs, and you end up with a patient instead of requiring 20 milligrams the next day, only five or zero. And that was the part one of the fascinating story about the dangers of opioids and the birth of opioid-free anesthesia by the true pioneer, Dr. Jan Paul Molier. Be sure to subscribe to the channel to be notified when the part two interview with Dr. Melier is released on practical management of an opioid-free anesthetic. Until next time.